Hello and welcome back to this series on creating SSH keys and connecting to cloud instances. In this video, we're going to go ahead and set up a cloud instance in DigitalOcean. And then from there, we'll transfer our public key into that and attempt to access it. So let's begin. We'll start by opening up a web browser and navigating to www.digitalocean.com or just digitalocean.com. For those of you who are brand new to this, you're going to go ahead and you're going to sign up. This sign up is going to require that you enter in a credit card and you'll be able to create your instance that we need for this particular video once your credit card is approved. Now, quick point, I am going to be setting up an instance that costs money. So if you're not interested in spending any money, then just be aware that there is a financial obligation if you move forward with following this video. Okay, now that we're signed up, let's go ahead and log in. So I'm going to hit the login button, and I'm going to put in my password, and I'm going to sign in. Now that I'm signed in, I'm going to go ahead and create a new instance. So I'm going to click the Create button, and I'm going to say Create Droplet or Cloud Server. From here, I'm going to choose Ubuntu 20.04. I'm going to keep the basic CPU. I'm going to change to a regular Intel SSD because I don't need a premium SSD. And I'm going to choose the $40 in a month or 0.06 per hour. And then I don't need to add any block storage. I'm going to choose New York 3, which is already chosen for me. You can choose whatever you want. Um, generally, you want to choose something that's closest to you so that you have nice performance between your local system and your remote system. Since in general, this is a decentralized way of doing work, it doesn't really matter where the instance lays. We're gonna keep our virtual private cloud network at default because we don't really need to go into depth with VPCs. We're gonna select monitoring so that we can get a nice dashboard when we're going to do our work. And then we have our SSH key. We're going to check that because we don't want to do a password because that's not secure. It even says here it's less secure. And then we're going to click on the new SSH key. Once we click on that SSH key, we're ready to add the contents of our public SSH key into the contents area. So starting with Apple, Macintosh, and Linux users, if we open up our terminal, and for Apple users, we're going to go ahead right from here, and we're going to start our cat command. For Linux users, which is what I am, I'm actually going to change directories first to my SSH directory. If I do an ls minus l here, I'll see my two files. If you're on a Macintosh and you do an ls minus l at your default directory, you should see these same two files that you created in the previous video. I'm going to go ahead and cat the id underscore rsa.pub. From here, I'm going to click and swipe everything. I just did a right click which saves it to my clipboard automatically. And then I'm going to come back to the contents of my SSH key, and I'm going to paste it in. I'm going to make sure that when I go up to the top that it starts with SSH-1. 
dash RSA, like you see here, and ends with the name of your system. It's not going to be the same as what I have here. It's going to be what is shown on your screen after the double equal sign. So if I take a peek at the bottom, I can see I have my double equal sign and I see the same thing, so I know I'm good. Then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to name it. And I'll name it Testnet RSA Key. That's just the name I'm giving it. You can give it any name that's equivalent to what your usage of this SSH key is. And then I click Add. Now you'll see that right here, my testnet SSH key is, is shown here. And when I put my mouse over it, you can actually see the entire SSH key in a tooltip, which is kind of cool. OK, for Windows users, I didn't forget about you. In order to grab your SSH key, you'll get that public key to paste in right here in your keygen putty session that we created earlier in earlier videos. Now, if you had closed this out from the earlier videos and you don't have this and you need to get this back up, there are several things that we can do. And just to show, it goes all the way down to here and all the way up to here. There are several things we can do. If I go ahead and uh, close this and I reopen PuttyGen, I can click the load button. When I click the load button, up will come, for me at this particular point, the exact location of where that constellation test key that we created earlier was. If I click on it and I say open, since we have a passphrase that we added into, it's going to ask for that passphrase. So if I bring over my notes, I can just grab my passkey and copy it and then paste it in. Hit the OK, and up will come my SSH key that I can then highlight and grab. One other option that we have is we can bring over Notepad and bring up our key. Then we can just simply drag our key into Notepad. Now, this is a little different of a format than what you found when we're doing the Linux side, but that's okay. When you paste this in, it should work. So now we can continue the video from where I had the Linux and Macintosh SSH key up. So now continuing, I'm going to go ahead and move down. I want one droplet and I can choose a host name for my system. So if I decided that this is for me as a testnet system, because I'm using testnet because I'm creating this for constellation. And I'm going to call it testnet node 01. So this is my testnet node 01 that I'm creating here. A tag you can name it just to help to simplify things uh, when you're doing other things like creating firewalls or whatnot. You can give it a tag. I just gave it a tag of the exact same name as my host name. So I know when I'm working with tags, which are just ways to annotate um, elements inside the cloud. Now I'm selecting the project for this, which um, you can create any project that you want. I'm not going to enable backups because I don't want to spend the extra $8 a month. I don't really need this to be backed up. And then I'm going to click Create Droplet. And you'll see that it slowly starts to create my testnet droplet. And we're done, and I have a external IP address for this droplet. Let's mark that down for later usage. Now what I need to find out is what my local systems IP address is for the next step of this video. So in a new tab here, I went to whatismyip.com and it gave me my IP information to which I copied into my clipboard. I can go back to my notes and I'm going to put in there the IP address of my local system. The next important piece that we need to do is set up a firewall 
so that we protect our system. And we have specific things that we want to enter into our firewall. So I'm going to go on the right side and I'm going to click on networking. I'm going to choose firewalls and I'm going to create a firewall. I'm going to name this firewall Testnet Security Group. Now, the inbound rules are the only thing that we care about at this particular time because the outbound rules, we're going to allow everything from our remote system to go outbound as long as the connection is started from the internal remote system so that we can do what we need to do on that system, such as do updates, access the internet, etc. So here I have the SSH which is our way of connecting through our secure shell, which we're learning in this series at SSH. Now it uses TCP port 22 to access our system. We'll leave that at default, but we do not want every IPv4 address on the internet and every IPv6 address on the internet to access our system through port 22. It's just bad security. That means people can sit there all day long and try and hit your machine and hope that they can get into it. Even though we have a 4096-bit SSH key and a passphrase associated with it, since we're dealing with our personal information, you know, for this particular case, something like cryptocurrency, we don't want people to be able to access our system at all, at all costs. So we do everything we can to keep this limited. So what I decided to do is X out the IPv4, X out the IPv6, and I want to add a source here. And the source that I'm going to add, and I'm going to say, I only want my local system with my particular IP address to access this. So I'll go ahead into my notes and I'll grab the IP address of my local system that I want to be able to access this remote system. And I'm going to paste it in here. And I'm going to add at the end slash 32. I wait a second and then it says to me add and the IP address slash 32. I'm going to move my mouse down and I'm going to click on it. That's going to add it. Now, if I have another system, say in my office, that I want to also allow access to this, I'll go to the office, I'll go to the what is my IP page, I'll find out what that IP address is. And I can enter that in here, slash 32. It'll think about it for a second. And then it'll say, add this. And if I click, it'll add that one. Now I have two IP addresses that are allowed to access this system. This 1.1.1.1 is fake. So I'm going to delete it by hitting that delete key. Now I want to add a new rule. So I'm going to click the new rule. It's going to be a custom rule. And for my particular purposes, I want to allow port 9000 through 9001, which is for the cryptocurrency testnet that I'm building the system for. And it's a requirement. And I want everybody on the internet to be able to access this. Now you say, well, with the SSH, I'm only allowing this, but all of a sudden you're sitting here allowing all everybody to hit this this 9000 port. Number one, this is a port above 1024, which is not a commonly known port. Number two, there's something listening on this port. So if you try to access it, there'll be a service listening that'll be hard to bypass. Now I have another new rule I want to create. It's going to be a custom rule and it's going to be port 9002. And again, for this one, I'm only going to allow my local system. So I'm going to type in the IP address of my local system with the slash 32 at the end, give it a second to load, and I'm going to click add an address. If I want to add my office or another location, I would do that here. Now port 9002 is hitting our specific node here to hit a web page, um, a specific element that is private to just the node owner, you or myself. So that's why I did this here. And I want to create one more custom port 
TCP port 9003, and I'm going to allow everybody to get to it. So port 9000, 9001, and 9003 are going to be accessible to everybody on the internet. It's part of this particular instance in this cloud for my purposes that I need. Now, granted, if you're here trying to build a firewall for yourself, for a web page, or for something else, you might not need all these ports. You would just really open up port 22 and maybe port 443 for um, secure HTTP and port 80 for regular HTTP um, and or maybe any other type of service that you need. So that's it for my firewall that I want. I'm done. So if I go all the way down to the bottom, I want to apply this firewall to one of my droplets. So there's where that tag comes in. I'm going to click in here and I'm going to start typing in the, the tag and it should pop up and show me that I have a bunch of tags and one of them is my droplet. So I'm going to choose this droplet that I created and then I'm going to click create firewall. Firewall was successfully created and I am done creating my instance in DigitalOcean and we're ready to access it. So in the next video, we'll go ahead and access our node to complete a successful creation of DigitalOcean. I hope this was informative for you. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.